Hello and welcome to Lecture 2. Uh, today we're talking about Hello World and Chisel. So, the common step in learning any programming language is the infamous Hello World. In other words, trying to just write the bare minimum program and get some sort of proof that it actually did something, right? So usually, you know, my language is simply putting the string Hello World to the terminal. Uh, we're going to use the equivalent of that for hardware design. So we're going to make the smallest, simplest hardware design we can think of making, push it through the tools, and go through that, right? And the reason why we're doing this is we're putting that thing in action we talked about on this course, that closing the loop, right? We want to um, get that done uh, as soon as possible, and then we can go ahead and, you know, have more sophisticated designs, more sophisticated options for tools, et cetera, but we want the whole process to go through today. So, Oops, look at this. Uh, advancing. So today, uh, you know, we have the Jupyter files as always. Uh, we push these uh, online publicly, so you're free to go ahead and download and play with them. Uh, so there's a service called Binder we're linking to in this course where if you have a public repo of Jupyter Notebooks, they will go ahead and host and run them for you, which is really helpful in our case because we depend on a few extra plugins to make uh, all the Scala and Chisel stuff work directly inside Jupyter. And you can definitely sell those things locally, but for day one, um, it's perhaps easier to run on there, but if you have more time, you can go ahead and follow the instructions that uh, our TA, Jason, has put together. Uh, it actually follows the shell script, install that shell, that, that SH, which will hopefully bring in some dependencies for you if you want to install that locally. Um, cool. So, as promised, uh, the plan for today is to give you just a little bit of case of skull, a little bit of chisel, and with those two pieces of combined, we're going to close the loop. We're going to run a small design through the entire flow, we're going to see the process. And so, and so the way we're going to go about lecturing, lecturing in this course is we're going to kind of have this process of maybe a little bit more Scala, a little bit more chisel, a little bit more Scala, a little bit more chisel. We're kind of just incrementally adding things in, right? So rather than trying to teach you all of Scala and then all of chisel part by part, we're going to kind of keep making more and more sophisticated things using more and more features. And so we're kind of intermixing things in the different phases, right? It's kind of like that agile philosophy in practice, right? Here we are. Can you get something working? You're going to be building simple modules and recently learn more features and make them more robust and more general and more flexible. Cool. So, uh, as I said before, uh, we're working on a language called Scala. So Scala uh, was, I believe the official start date was 2007, but uh, it wasn't really super popular until a few years later. It's a language created by Martin Dersky, and then of course now has a large community support. Uh, and so what, what is this language? Well, it is a uh, JVM-based language, so it runs on top of the Scala, uh, sorry, the Java virtual machine. Uh, interops rates great with uh, Java. And um, so why did I like for Chisel? It was chosen for Chisel for a few reasons. So number one, this language was designed to make domain-specific languages or embedded DSLs. Uh, and so it's really good at kind of mimicking syntax or ways to make things look more natural, even though it's just functions, functions inside of Scala. The other nice thing about Scala is it actually has very good support for both object-oriented programming as well as functional programming. And we use both of those uh, a fair amount to make really nice parameterized designs, right? Hopefully clear, you know, if you have a really good object card, you can get really good reuse by kind of a nice modular thing and kind of reusing things from inheritance. And then, of course, functional programming, we have very elegant instructions that kind of wire things together. There's a very nice, uh, maybe perhaps the words, congruence between hardware circuits and functional programming, you know, functional programming, one of its common tenants, you know, to have things be immutable and they're really focused on data flow, and that's a very good analogy for a circuit. And so that's why there's a really good connection there. Um, one of the things you come across working with Scala is the language philosophy. Uh, they try to catch a lot of things in compile time. So it's a very strong static type system, and a lot of things that, you know, perhaps a language might let go by is going to complain about. And initially, this might seem like a burden. Uh, but then you kind of get bought into their philosophy and realize it's actually a good thing. Right? And, and so, the reason why is that the goal is to catch more things in compile time that fewer, you know, surprising or unexpected or even worse, hard to find, hard to detect, hard to debug errors at runtime. Right? And so, uh, a lot of times you'll be surprised as a veteran programmer, programmer myself. Uh, if I can get the code to compile, it's not guaranteed to be right, of course, but I tend to actually have less. Uh, bugs once they get the code compiling in Scala and other languages, languages right? right? You, you actually really do uh, remove a large fraction of errors with a strong compile time checks. Now, now as a beginner, beginner or you're probably going to see more uh, compile time errors. It's going to be frustrating. So my, my biggest, biggest advice about this 
is to use a tool like an IDE. So we'll have some resources put on the web page about this. We recommend an IDE because, of course, an IDE, even before you tell it to go to compile step, it can, you know, give you a little uh, warning on the, you know, on the view saying, hey, this is a syntax error. I know already it's not going to compile. And I can help you see it right away where it is and get that information right away. And some of the IDEs even have better error messages, right? right? So that's a really helpful thing to do. Uh, the notebooks you're going to see today are really uh, fun way to interact with things. Unfortunately, the differences aren't, aren't fantastic, right? Um, so I do recommend an IDE. Now, if you think an IDE is too heavyweight, which understandable people don't always enjoy it, I'm kind of a little bit of a minimalist myself, there's, there's a really neat tool called Scala Metals, which I'll also link to. And it's a plugin you can plug into a lot of public text editors, such as, you know, Vim, Emacs, VS Code, uh, Atom, whatever you use. And it provides Scala syntax highlighting as well as these warnings about uh, the pre compiling. So that's, you can get that in your favorite text editor too. Um, cool. So that's kind of a very brief pitch at a high level of Scala. But like I said, the reason why we're using this is it's really like making an embedded DSL. Well, it's actually we, I said, the creator of Chisel. Um, and said so the object oriented functional stuff is really helpful. We also take advantage of, like I said, all these Java libraries, right? So if you want to have a generator, for example, talk to the database to get certain parameters out, no problem. You just go ahead and use that Java library just fine. So it's very, very handy to have this kind of first class, legitimate programming language support. Uh, a lot of other hard description languages are you know, very good hard descriptions, but some other things you need to kind of make a reasonable program, that's not really the main focus, that's kind of awkward to kind of handle those points. Here you have a proper programming language that you can handle those things just fine. Okay, okay, so when, when you actually go about running Scala, Scala how do you, do you go about doing that? Well, uh, in the normal case, where you actually compile Scala program and then execute it, so remember, you know, uh, I said before, Scala runs on top of the Java virtual machine. So if things are run on top of the Java virtual machine, you can compile to you know, Java bytecode. Um, and so that's done by Scala compile, right? And perhaps in many languages, you're used to having uh, a very concise way to get a little world program running. For Scala, Scala, it's not exactly true. Good, good news is, is you can go ahead and find a template, <laughs> and just boom, you have a template, and you can get going with that. The reason why is you want to have, usually a build tool and an ID to worry about all the issues of how do you compile which files with which flags and trigger and launch things. To go ahead and make each file from scratch and to like call the compiler right files and invoke a JVM to run the right file, and that can be done. Uh, it's pretty laborious. Uh, if you take you know, other courses that use Scala, they will almost all tell you the same thing to not do that. <laughs> Uh, in this, this course, we're going to try and figure out as much as possible. So for a project, we use a tool called SBT, which is called the Scala Build Tool. And then it handles all this for you, right? It handles the building. Uh, it can run tests, whatever you want to do. It also can track dependencies and pull in the exact right version of certain uh, packages you might need. Uh, so that's a really handy thing. And so we'll use that primarily. And primarily, we'll give you preset repos. So you can just go ahead and you know, clone a repo, add the code you need to add to it, and you don't need to worry about the whole getting started, making your own repo from scratch. But, but if you did want to do that, we highly recommend using these template repos, which have all the pieces kind of pop up the parts you just need. Um, so that's, that's kind of normal way Scala's run. run. Uh, there's another, another option, which is kind of a REPL environment. environment. So you can go, go ahead and, you know, in a read it about print, you know, in a little interpreter, type one line at a time and evaluate and see the behavior one line at a time. That's really helpful for trying out a feature and kind of bugging and making sure my understanding, you know, is Scala working right? And, and so, so that's, that, that, that was the state of things until only a few years ago. And then, you know, with the popularity of notebooks, people have been getting more ambitious about what can we do about this. And so uh, people taking the interpreter style of Scala, turn it into a proper scripting language, and then extend that and still put that inside the notebook. So that's what we're actually using for this course. These notebooks are pretty cool. We're able to write Scala snippets and run them inside notebooks. These are kind of just little Scala snippets directly. Normally, normally it's not okay, right? Normally if you want to run Scala, you need to put it inside classes and have a main and all that kind of stuff. But this is kind of scripting more hands-on approach. This is something unique to the capabilities. And so you're using that through notebooks, but when you work in homework and other things are larger like your project, you need to use an ID or something to actually have that proper uh, build system and such. Cool. All right, so let's get past the boring stuff. Fun stuff. So let's say, for example, you want to take some literals in Scala. So uh, you know, Scala has the basic types. You know, you know things, things you expect, and so, uh, you know, ints, floats, etc. cetera. Um, one thing you see about Scala is that uh, even though it's like a C Java descendant, it, it doesn't actually use semicolons. They're optional, and since they're optional, people generally, most of tell you not to use them. Uh, so uh, this is just, you know, here you're in a Jupyter notebook with a couple of like, expressions, so you're all probably pretty familiar with like an interpreter, right? So we can go ahead and run this, and yeah, okay, you know, we can add some numbers. 
uh, uh, you know, know perform operations. operations. What's interesting to look at, of course, is, you know, regular you know, numbers, numbers are, turn, turn out to be an integer, integer right? Uh, things look like, you know, uh, decimals, decimals, of course, turn into doubles. So this, this, this is a double, double right? And a double divided by, by even an int turns out to be a double. double. Okay. okay. And, and yeah, yeah, there's, there's some strings. strings. So, cool. So that's, that's just, you know, seeing the literals when we see them in Scala. Let's talk about types. So, let's say, one of the strings of Scala is a type system. So it's... Statically, statically typed, meaning, meaning they don't need to declare a variable. variable. There's a single, single type, and that's going to be pretty entire uh, lifetime of that variable. And, and it's pretty strict about which types can do what. It's not, not permissive about how things are interacting. I'm going to go, go back. I believe I have a question. question. Uh, please, please go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, oh, so the question, I'm going to start writing the recording, is, okay, okay since, since we did, uh, you know, 2 plus 3 like this, what's, what's it going to do? Well, uh, this is going to be evaluated to 5. Uh, this particular, you know, interactive session we have going with our combination of the interpreter running inside of all the other things inside of a notebook, uh, it goes ahead and gives a name to these intermediate values, and it gives tells what they are. So we're going to cover that in the next slide, but... Uh, in Scala, it puts the type after the variable name, right? So what this is saying is assign the arbitrary name result zero underscore zero to uh, this. It's of type int, and its value is five. That's kind of what this interpreter is telling us, right? So this is, this is kind of interpreted mode. I think what's kind of important for us to be aware of is just how we write Scala, we as humans writing it would look like, as well as um, what the outcomes are, right? So this might become more clear, I think, on the next slide. Uh, where, where we look, look at the types, types right? right? So, uh, like, like I said, so Scala, everything is uh, an object, uh, even, even the simple things. things. So, so like in Scala, in Java, you know some things are basic, basic types versus complex types. Everything's, everything's an object. Uh, so you can call methods, methods on everything. You can call, call methods on, you know, even, even like, uh, you know, numbers. numbers. Um, and all these types need to be known at the compile time. time. And if it can't, it's going to complain to you. What's interesting is language is called type inference, meaning that you don't have to always label a type of thing. It'll infer it, right? So, of course, a literal, that makes sense to infer it. But actually, variables passed around and declared, you'll always need to put a type annotation, and then you can figure it out, right? So, uh, here's, you know, the number four, which, uh, you know, okay, it's a literal, sure, it's a four. But let's say, okay, if you want to go through both, we can put a type on it. And remember, the type goes after, so it's, you know, value or name, colon, type. That's Interesting thing they chose to do for uh, the Scala, Scala syntax. syntax. And, okay, so you have that forward, you know, declare, declare as an int, as a float, as a double, uh, as a car. Uh, but like, like I said before, this is a, this is a true um, object, right? So if I want to say, you know, uh, for that, you know, uh, I can just call method on it. So let's so say I want to cast it to a float. Uh, that also works, right? So, so you know, know it's like a number, like a literal. literal. It's actually, actually like I said, to the proper object, you can call functions on it. Um, so we're going to play that out. So this is kind of a neat thing, thing about Scala, where we have these types, types where we can uh, often omit them. Uh, there's, there's some places where it's really good to make sure you have them, like places, places you know, like uh, parameters to and from a function. We'll cover that kind of piece. We're just kind of feet wet, just a little bit of Scala. That way we'll see later stuff will be quite so confusing. Great. OK, let me make sure to pause for any questions. Great. Great. Okay. okay. Well, we can continue. continue. All right. right. So, for um, declaring Scala variables, variables, this is little, like, like the last little, uh, I guess, wrinkle, perhaps unusual, unusual part of the language. And that, and that is that you actually, you actually annotate each variable when you create it as either a var or a val. Um, so, so var and val are short for variable and value. And, and what, what does, does this mean? mean? Well, you're saying, is this thing going to be Mutable or, or immutable. In other words, words can, can I change it? Or is it like basically a constant, constant right? right? And, and so, so this is actually really interesting. interesting. So in, in most languages, languages, when you declare a variable, variable you, can you can assign it, you can assign it again, you can keep reassigning, reassigning it. So, so it's essentially, it's like, like a bar, right? right? So it's mutable variable, variable, you can kind of change how you want. And in most of those classic languages, you know, occasionally you have a constant you know you want, so you go ahead and mark it const or something, right? And you mark it as constant, that way you don't change it. 
in Scala, Scala it, really it really tries, tries to, to encourage you to use that const style variables, variables like, like all the time. So, so speak some values, so to speak, right? So you can clear a lot of your, uh, things as vowels, and, and when you click with the vowel, you can't change it. Uh, and, and that might sound like a really big hindrance, but when you get, get better kind of recent as well as some of the functional formula concepts we'll discuss later on in the course, you find it's actually nothing hard to do to this. It's actually kind of nice, because every time you would perhaps previously just kind of keep reusing the same variable, it has kind of different semantic meanings. Each time you use it, you can assign it to a new vowel and give it a new name, and, and that can, you know, perhaps, perhaps have more semantic needs in humans reading and writing that code. Uh, additionally, you know, of course, you recognize that the compiler, when you tell things are vowels, it knows, OK, well, it's going to be created once. And so it's able to do a lot more safety checks, a lot more authorization checks. And so this could have all these vowels and a lot of variables. It doesn't necessarily mean your code is taking more memory. If anything, it might actually go faster because the cloud can do more aggressive tricks to optimize that. Um, so let's see a little tiny example here at the bottom, right? So uh, what do we do? Well, we declared a mutable variable, a, a variable, uh, the var, right? right? Okay. okay. And, and so, so we're able to create it, and then we're able to assign it, we're able to, it. It. We're able to put a new value to it. And then, then we, we also declared a context, right? right? So, so for example, example, if I tried, tried to uh, change the vowel and say, hey, I should be 20 now, as I said, I can't do that, right? Because now I have just, you know, broken that rule and uh, trying to reassign to a vowel. vowel. So at, at the time, time you, uh, you know, create these vowels, you have a vowel you're trying to uh, assign to them. Uh, and, and there's some more wrinkles. This will come back to uh, later, later on in terms, in terms of, of how it works, works in terms, terms of references and objects and, objects and such. But, but for now, it's a kind of point where you can reassign vowels. You can not reassign vowels. You're trying to vowels as much as possible. You can basically get by never using a bar. Question. Please go ahead. Oh, oh, great, great catch. catch. So, so as, as you pointed, pointed out, out, I missed this. this. I was expecting an error, but I got an error for a different reason, reason right? right? You're absolutely right. right. So, so I could not find context. context. So, so you're right. If I went ahead and fixed that, that now it's saving time with the valve. So great. So number one, <laughs> thanks for helping me fix that uh, demo. Um, so uh, as a general style, I don't think it's great to have variable names in a different only case. However, to answer your question, could I declare? Another, Another one without complaining, complaining me? I don't know the answer. answer. And that's kind of what we're having this thing, is we can just go ahead and see what happens. happens. So what, what happens if, uh, you know, I declare a new variable, but only different in case? Uh-oh. Let's, let's just do that. that. So even though let's, let's just do that, that I, would I would recommend against that. that. <laughs> um, um, you know, uh, everyone has their own kind of opinions about cases. My attitude is you shouldn't count case sensitivity, nor should you count case sensitivity, right? In other words, you should be unique in a case-sensitive way. But, but you only use one, one case, case uh, uh, the record thing, 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 thing you need, right? right? So, so uh, yeah, yeah, so, so I think the language, language, language variable names are case sensitive, sensitive uh, but I would not take advantage of that intentionally. Um, it would be good to you know, have longer, more robust names. Great point. And then, you know, same thing. Here we declare this as a var, and we get that out, we know it's going to break. Because we're resigning the var. And like I said, as you work with language, you're going to be more and more comfortable doing purely vowels. Uh, or mostly vowels, vowels and, and we, it'll, it'll be fine. Be fine. Um, but, but just, just we're going to focus on day one before we see any chisels because any variable we declare, declare has to be a var or a vowel. So you're going to see that keyword, keyword and I want to make sure, sure we kind of cover, cover that. Great. Great. Uh, uh, other, other questions? questions. Cool. Uh, uh, let's, let's, let's keep, keep going. going. So now, now we finally get to fun stuff. Start talking about some chisels, right? So as, As I said, said, the chisel is an acronym, acronym, right? So chisel is uh, constructing hardware and it's called embedded language. That's what chisel stands, stands for. You know, it's an acronym, acronym usually only capitalizes the first C. Um, so, so in other words, uh, when you make a hardware design in chisel, it's actually just a balanced Scala program. program. And, and the hardware it produces the output of the program, right? right? And, and so when you're thinking about it that way, what really what's going on is, yeah, you're just using chisel like a library and it looks like a library language. You have to be, you know, Building, building and instantiating, constructing objects with library, library you know, chisel objects, and you put them together, together and you run the program, program. As, as a byproduct, this program produces the output of the hardware. hardware. Now, uh, what's kind of cool, cool about you know, the features of Scala is that it has nice features for uh, embedding, embedding the cells, 
uh, it had a lot of properties, right? In terms of not just the static type, 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 not just the type tricks, tricks, but also syntax-wise. Syntax -wise. So, so uh, we, we can overload a lot of operators. operators. Uh, uh, you're going to see that in some places. places. There's, There's a lot, lot of operators too overloaded in appearing in our language. There's an interesting punctuation as such. We can do that as well. Interestingly as well, there's also some interesting alternatives syntactically for expressing certain things. And these things may seem esoteric, but initially you apply in the context of a DSL, it makes, it makes it feel a little bit more like a real language rather than just using a library. But at the end of the day, what are we doing? We're writing, writing Scala programs. programs. They just, just happen to be using a library called Chisel that you know, has, has a certain properties. properties. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, like it's a legitimate Scala program. program. And that's and one thing that I want to really kind of cover these first few lectures, lectures to get people kind of the mindset of realizing that, yes, we're writing programs, and this program internally is connecting hardware. And so fully rocking... What is, what is to, to write, write a program, program as well as to think about, about the hardware circuit, circuit kind of reconcile, reconcile those two things is a really big concept. concept. We're trying to cover in these first few lectures and love to, you know, come to the office hours, talk about that in these groups, like, sorry, I'm on Slack, et cetera, to really get that uh, concept, concept clear. clear. Okay, okay, so maybe it helps you see a diagram, diagram right? So, as I said, if you have a chisel design, it's a valid Scala program, right? So, these human are going to write a dot Scala file, that's your design, pass it off to the Scala compiler, and then Scala compiler is compiled and make a program. Right? right, and that, and that program, program, even if it's not parameterized, parameterized it's still a generator. generator. It's, it's going to produce, it's going to generate uh, hardware. Right, right. Uh, uh, in, in particular, it's going to create what we call circuits. And this circuit, and this circuit is a description of the hardware. hardware. Right, so, so um, technically, it's this, this intermediate representation we call fertile, and it has, has a dot .fir file, which you can pass on to other tools that actually turn into various outputs. But the point is that. On, on the, the left, left here, we had uh, a generated program, program right? right? You know, which, which who knows what it's going to do. do. On the right, right now, we have a concrete, specific design, right? right? And this, this now says, you know, there is this gate, gate this logic gate attached, this register, register which is attached, this other logic gate, this input. input. Like, like, that, that is, is all very concrete and specifically listed out. out. And it says under, under the hood, it's like a text file that lists out, you know, all the I don't know how handle this, but you can still think this is like a concrete, specific hardware design. And... All we All did as humans is write this program, program which this is a byproduct, byproduct right? right? And, and, and as they know, know along the way, it's going to uh, use, use a library. library. So now, now it's a circuit, circuit, we can do, do a number of things, things right? We, we can, can run it through uh, backend tools to produce Verilog and other dimensional hardware tools where we want to map an FPGA, make an ASIC, etc. We can also simulate it. And the reason why I have this broken up, here we've seen just the front end, and later in lecture today we're going to see the back end. It's kind of two different parts, right? So normally we're kind of focusing on the front end, which is Creating, creating the circuit, the circuit and, then and then once you have, have the circuit, circuit what, what are you going to do with it? For much, much of this course, course once you make, make the circuit, circuit what we're going to do is we're going to simulate it, test it, and evaluate it, right? right? But, but some of the time, we're also going to circuit and push it some tools to try and see what might be physical costs, right? And maybe physical costs may choose an external optimization thing like that. Okay, so this is the big picture trying to understand how we're doing with chill programs. So we're going to pause and any more questions before we go on. Which way, so I can try, try and turn, turn on my view so I can see hands and get raised. raised. Uh, okay. okay, great. great. So, uh, let's uh, see some chisels. So, uh, here's, uh, here's some of the magic, magic uh, that, that was produced by the creators of something called the Chisel Bootcamp, which is a great set of notebooks, as well as uh, augmented by our RTA, uh, Jason, some great work. We're actually going to be loading in a bunch of stuff uh, to a uh, process, process, right? So, so this, this is stuff that maybe take, take a lot longer to do inside Binder, inside binder but for now, you can just treat this as like boilerplate code, code you need to touch with and mess with, but if you, you want to do chisel inside a notebook, notebook, you're going to need at least this code as well as some files inside the repository to get you set up. Basically, it's doing just loading and chisel and that sort of stuff. And like I said, chisel, you know, needs Scala. And so long as Scala and Jupyter is not too bad, but getting this kind of scripting behavior like a notebook, that, that requires things called almond and stuff like that. that. Okay, okay, so let's go ahead and, and play with some stuff. stuff. So, uh, uh, what, what types are there in Chisel? Chisel? Well, uh, there's, there's three, three basic, basic types. types. There's more, more types, types we're going to come across, across but, but in, in terms, terms of like, like really basic, basic single you know, kind of types, you can have, have a bool, which is a single bit. bit. Worth, worth contrasting that from a boolean, you know, yes, very similar name and purpose, but uh, bool is in chisel, chisel boolean is in Scala. Scala. So this, this is kind of a very common thing to keep an eye on 
is it to keep you a, a good sense of which, which is a scalar variable versus, versus what's a chisel variable. When we say chisel variable, we're really kind of referring to the types, right? Is it, is it a scala type or a chisel type? Chisel type? And, and going, going back, back to the purposes, purposes right, what matters, matters is when these variables can be used, right? So if it's something you want to use when the program is running to generate hardware, well, in order to work right in the program, it needs to be a scalar variable or scalar type, right? However, if it's something we want to be in the circuit that gets admitted, right? If something is existing, it needs to be uh, uh, you know, chisel, chisel type and chisel lock, right? right? So something to kind of keep track of. Likewise, Likewise we have both assigned and unsigned integer, integer types, types uh, uint, uint and essence. essence. Uh, uh, however, these types, types can uh, have arbitrary, arbitrary bit widths, right? right? They can be uh, one, one bit wide, up to you know, whatever it is. I think it's very large, very wide, very wide bus signals. And so, you know, uint is probably one of your most common for everything. It's just kind of very handy unsigned ints. If you need signed behavior, there is an essence. Uh, we, we use that, that uh, sometimes as well. Um, and kind, kind of following, following in this uh, you know, Scala type, type inference model, model uh, you, you actually don't need to specify every bit with all, all the time. time. So, so you, you actually can say, say I need uint, uint. And, and then uh, the, the functionality, functionality tool flow will actually will infer based, based on the inputs, inputs and, what and what you're doing uh, what the bit width should be. I believe there might have been a question. I'm sorry if that person wants to speak up. Oh, oh, so, so, so it's a great, great question. question. That's about, about bit widths, right? So, so the, the question, question about, about the bit widths and when you mix them, them when are they resolved, resolve, how do they resolve? resolve. So uh, there's, there's multiple, multiple levels of this happening inside the tool flow. flow. Uh, and, and so, so part, part of it makes it a little bit uh, confusing. confusing and kind of, it's supposed to be a little more detail on what's happening on today. Is it that turtle file? We introduce it as a turtle file. You know, it's an IR for hardware. There's actually multiple levels of turtle, and, and uh, in the highest, highest level of turtle, which is by the chisel, chisel front end, uh, some bit bits can be unspecified. However, However that's, you know, not very helpful, helpful for a lot of tools downstream. downstream. So, so there's some other code in libraries, libraries called the actual code of the turtle library, which actually processes that turtle file, file so we refer to the lowering process, process and then they go ahead and make this turtle more concrete. So things that are unresolved bit widths now are resolved bit So the answer is, at some point, you imagine you do a turtle file which has all of these whips, whips resolved. resolved. Um, and that's and done by, by tools, and when it can't do it, it's going to say, hey, wait, 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 no, I'm not going to be harder because you need, need to be a little more to resolve uh, these whips. whips. Now, now um, you mentioned this in a few slides, slides, I can give you a preview of that, that now, in terms of what, what the whips are. are. Uh, it, you know, you know when, when you give it a literal, literal it's going to make it the minimum size in order to capture that literal. When you do mathematical operations, depending on the operation, in some cases, it's totally reasonable to actually have, have uh, operands, operands of different, different widths, widths operate, that's okay. okay. Uh, and, and then the output width, width is operator dependent. dependent. So some, some operators have, you know, oh, it's the max of two input widths, width, or, or it's the max, max plus, plus one, one or something. Or something. So uh, there's, there's, there's a, a table you can look up and you kind of see if you're an operator, operator you know, what constraints are there in the inputs and what's the output going to be. But for now, it was kind of nice is, you know, if you know what your widths need to be, you can go ahead and put them in. If you don't know, uh, you, you can, uh, you know, let, let it infer some of the cases. cases. Now, when you, you have, have a large project, project there's obviously plenty of places where you're going to want to um, be more, more deliberate <laughs> and then not leave it to chance. chance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and so, so but this, this is already, already kind, kind of still a slight benefit. benefit. Um, Most of this comes up is that sometimes, sometimes you can imagine when you have a more parameterized generator, at the lowest levels, you definitely know how big things are. But some of the more aggregated things later on, you want to leave that to be resolved later on, so that way you kind of have that flexibility rather than trying to calculate it all in advance. Um, and, and this, this is a good question I keep bringing back up, and I keep going through the material and keeping things play out. Um, so another thing I'm going to see here is uh, using a Scala language feature, once again, again we're kind of going to build embedded DSLs, it's something, something called mixins. Uh, so what's cool about the Scala here is we can uh, add functions to objects that already exist, right? So in particular, and then mentioned you want to keep, keep it a clear distinction between, between your Scala types and your Chisel types. Uh, so, so zero, you know, that, that, by, by itself, itself, that would just be, uh, you know, an integer, integer literal, you know, in Scala. We put, we put dot, dot B on it. On it. Dot, dot B is something the Chisel library is added, is mixed, mixed in, in to Scala. And, and now we are casting that to a bool. Uh, uh, you know, so, so meanwhile, a true by itself, that's just a Boolean value in Scala type. 
versus, versus uh, dot, dot B, B. Now, now I'm casting that, that to a bool in chisel. chisel. Uh, and, uh, and you'll hear if you can see, for example, I'm declaring it. So we'll just do the, the bools first. first. Oops. I have, I have a stray B down, down there. there. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll come down with the W in a second. second. So you can so see, see again, right? Like I said, if, you, uh, if, if I, I didn't have, have that B on there, watch the zero, zero it's int, right? right? But by, by putting, putting the B, I've, I've now, now told Scala to cast that to a chisel bool. bool. Likewise, Likewise, it's true by itself that's a, a Scala boolean. Uh, uh, if I want it to be a chisel literal, dot B it, okay. You get the chisel bool. And then you can declare it, right? So if I'm declaring, in this case, I'm declaring a, you know, Chisel, chisel bool, bool using a chisel, chisel bool literal, literal perfect, perfect, right? right? Now, now let's, let's say I got, got this wrong, right? right? It's, it's not, not going to cast because it's going to tell me I shouldn't, I shouldn't do that, that right? right? Likewise, uh, you know, let's, let's say I wanted, I wanted to do this, this with like a Scala. Scala. Uh, uh, no, no, it's, it's not, not going to work, right? It's going to be strictly the types. We're going to need to line them up. So that's just like a simple rule. For you int, once again, right? This six, that's int. It's a Scala int. If we want like a literal with an R design, we need, we need to cast, cast that, that to a, a, a Scala, Scala you, if I right, chisel you, and that's dot, dot u. u. Now, you can, you can see uh, the u int type. type. It's a u int type, type, but when we actually we print it out, one of the things we added to the library was the ability to see the bit width, width right? So we, so we see it, it, for example, it's three bits, bits in this case. case. Um, this is kind of using a syntax that looks a little bit reminiscent of course templates in C++, but this is just printing the output with something internal. Look at three bits. How do you get three bits? Well. Number six, six uh, you, you need, need three bits, bits from that, that, right? You hold on in more than three bits, bits but uh, three bits is the fewest bits in whole six, right? right. Um, cool. cool. And, and then, then what, if what if I want to set the width, width explicitly? explicitly? So, so width, width are actually a type, right? So one, so one thing that's very common in Scala is in order to use types for everything, they're specialized. So not just a number, it's actually a width type, a bit-width type. So if you want to actually use it, you need to cast it as a width type, and so you need to use the dot w. So here you're saying I want a u int of six, six literal. literal, and I want, I want to be eight, eight bits wide, wide right? right? So that's, that's what we get here. here. Neat. Neat. All right. All right. And, and then uh, this, this means putting literals by themselves. Of course, I want to declare it as, as you know, vowels. I can, I can you know, uh, declare, declare it and, and see, like, you know, like, you know uh, my u int, right? right? Uh, you do need three bits to hold a four, right? That's why I have u int three. Let's say I knew I want eight bits. Well, I can also put the width there. And for essence, uh, you, know, you know it's similar, similar as well. So, so, so for this thing of feet wet, you're just looking at some, some of these literals. literals. And so, um, um, cool. cool. Okay. okay. So, so let's, let's now. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause, pause and some more questions, questions before I go on. on. Uh, okay. okay. Well, well, let's let's let's, let's go, go ahead, ahead and maybe look, look at some operators, operators right? right? So, so um. Here, what, what do we have? have? Well, well uh, in terms of operators, operators there's, there's basically just about everything in this language, language that you kind of expect, expect right? right? You know, if, if you, you want, want to do logical operations, operations if you want to do arithmetic operations, 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 you want to do bitwise operations, operations uh, relational, relational they're, they're, they're all, all there, there right? right? Uh, uh, the caveat on why you look at the, the table when we first the time doing this is to make sure there's not any wrinkles you expect. The only one that they're most commonly to triple up is that we have to use a slightly different set of symbols for equality tests. As a, As a common, common one, we use a triple, triple equals, equals for equals and, and this uh, other symbol, symbol for non-equals. Non -equals. Uh, why, why are we doing, doing that? Uh, that's, that's done that way in Chisel because, because uh, the, the choice, choice is made deliberately to not overload the regular operator. Uh, and the reason why, why is that type is very helpful to do things, things like um, equality tests and references. Right? Right? So, so when you have a vowel in Scala, it's essentially like a reference to a variable. So being able to kind of compare those references be equal, equal or not equal, equal is kind of really important thing for language. A lot of libraries kind of read about things. So we don't want to mess up that. And that's, that's why we need a different, different one. A lot of other operations, operations they really, really load up syntax operators you expect. Uh, as I mentioned, you should, you should look, look at the table, table to figure out the bit width. width. For, for example, for add, if you do just, just plus by itself, itself it's, it's going to keep the width of the larger of the two, which means potentially there's a chance for truncation, right? Because if it overflows, it's going to happen. There's, There's another, another version of that, that which actually is guaranteed to, to grow, grow as needed, or, or multiply as grow as needed. And remember, if they say grow as needed, it's going to grow as needed at elaboration time. So it's going to figure, figure out what's the maximum, maximum worst case. case. Grow, grow it at that size. size. Um, and so, so it doesn't mean it's going to be hard to So it's going to have to pick the maximum size at that point. This is a small detail. You can't see this kind of later on. You can see the weeds. 
Now, we, now play we play with these. When we, we try and add them, we quickly remind them that these are uh, chisel, chisel variables. variables. So maybe, maybe first we'll make them scholar variables. variables. Oops. Ups. And, and of course, we we'll know about, about that, so we're not going to worry about that for now. Okay, so a scholar variable, yeah, no, we can do math. Um, now, now to make these into chisel viewings, right? right. What's, what's going to happen? Oops. It's going to be yellow, yellow us, right? right? Um, and, and I'm, I'm doing, doing this because I want to kind of remind you that, you know, you know uh, we're, we're dealing, dealing with chisel things, right? 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 These, these are objects that are supposed to be emitted, emitted in hardware, hardware right? right? So, so you don't necessarily want to be in the practice of figuring out a value set program at runtime because they aren't, right? We're describing a right? A circuit is a graph of, of you, know, you know, logic, logic gates, gates, operators, operators registers, etc. Et uh, and, and so, so something, something that we're constructing as topology, topology is going to be made by later on tools. tools. It's, it's not, not something we'll do math on. on. So that's, that's kind of why, why I want to kind of contrast, contrast this and make people aware of that. Um, um, it's particularly detailed, detailed small thing inside, inside the compiler where it's saying, oh, oh yes, you know, if you want to have components when it comes time to run things, they need to be inside of a module as a context. This one is moments where we've the chip creators are the best to try and hide effects embedded, embedded DSL, DSL, but at the end, end of the day, it is embedded DSL. DSL so, so some of the things make the language work kind of requires surrounding context. context. In this case, a module is actually to run a couple of minutes, minutes, and that has some underhood object oriented tricks kind of helping it. So, I guess I want you when you play around to understand there's some kind of constraints, particularly when it comes to these nodes, you need to have them inside modules, but more generally, I said it's just scholar over versus chip over, right? Kind of what you're using for. Okay, okay, so let's actually go, go ahead and build, build a chisel object. object. So here's that, that module we're discussing, right? So module is a uh, you know, type inside the chisel library, library that we uh, extend you know, using object-oriented inheritance uh, in order to handle, handle our, our, our use cases, cases right? right? And um, so this, this is like a super, super, super simple, simple module. module. So, so what, what does, what does it, do? it do? Uh, it, it has two Boolean inputs, uh, sorry. Each, you know, one bit. And, and one, one output, output. And, and simply it sets, it sets the output, output to the inputs. So, so uh, this, this is a diagram, diagram I draw to kind of show functionality. functionality. Uh, and, uh, and so, so for now, you can actually lot of time with boilerplate, or at least maybe not one where less than that detail. But you can kind of see what's happening, right? There's you know, I/O for input, input output. output. That's actually a standard field you need to have in your modules. You can't make this whatever you want. And then, and then inside, inside there, of course, you have some inputs, inputs or outputs, right? right. And, we'll and we'll learn, learn some cool stuff later on about how we can, you know, replace this bundle of other things. things. But, but for now, now it needs to be an I.O. And then you can do something, something right? right? And what, what are you doing? Well, this, this is an XOR, XOR between, between two things. things. Okay. okay. And, then and then we're connecting, connecting it to this. So actually, so wait. No stop right here, right? That's not an equal sign. That's a colon equals. So that's the connection or assignment operator inside of... Chisel. Chisel. What, what I'm saying, saying is, take, take the result of the right hand sign and attach that to the left hand side, the left -hand side right? right? So, uh, I would have seen now, you know, if this is the wire, wire it's going to be connected to, to uh, the result of the XOR of these two things, right? So, you can kind of see that in the diagram right, right where, you know, we have this uh, I.O. bundle, this name for this, you know, interface. It comes in, so we have inputs A and B, inputs are going in, they go into the XOR gate, and then output the XOR gate we're attaching to C. So that's, so that's what we're trying to do. We go ahead and let you know, create it. I just confirmed we made a class. Cool. cool. Okay. I'm going to pause here before we do uh, a demo, demo for more, for more questions. questions. Yes. yes. Please, please go, go ahead. ahead. Oh. oh. Sure. 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 So, so uh, equals. equals is a thing, thing that you use in Scala, Scala right? right? It, it uh, assigns something, 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 something else, else, right? right? So, so for, example, for example, here, you know, equals is being used in a valid definition, definition right? right? We're defining val a, a equals something, something else. else. Uh, in, in the case of, you know, using, using a bar, you can reassign things. You can't reassign vowels. For chisel, when we want to assign things amongst chisel types, we're going to kind of think of chisel types for Scala types. We use the colon equals for similar reasons, right? Where we chose to have a distinct uh, syntax, syntax to make it easier, easier to not conflict with some things built into the language. language. And, and so, yeah, so, yeah, so you, so you want to connect things in your hardware, you use, use this colon equals. equals. So, so connecting connect things, things on the right to things, things on the left. So, for example, so if, if I tried, tried to make this uh, an equal, it's going to probably yell at me. Yeah, yeah, yeah so it's, it's, it's going to say reassign with the bell. But even if I, um, yeah, so it's a reassign with the bell. It's not going to work. 
right? right? So, so we, we want to connect, connect these things, things right? So remember, uh, if you think, think about, about what IO.C, IO.C is, is IO is a val. Inside, inside of it, it has, has you know, some other vals. So IO.C is a whole, that, that, that's, that's a val. A val. And, and so the, the reference, reference to IO.C, IO.C you know, you know, the reference, reference to IO.C, IO.C has, has not changed. changed. That's still, still the same, same object in memory. memory. However, However, the internal the object, object has been, been changed slightly, slightly right? right? We've now, now connected IO.C to its input. It's now connected to the output of this XOR gate, which is right? So... Uh, uh, by, doing by doing this operation, operation this, this creates, creates an XOR gate. It's an object that has, has some name which you're not even seeing here. The, the output, output of that is being connected, connected to IO.C. Uh, uh, question, question from, from chat, chat is, is what, what if, if I was, I was to, to put a uh, var on one, one of these? Great, Great question. question. That, that may cause a compile issue. We'll find out. That's allowed. It's probably, it's probably also, also let me do, do this, this too. too. It's going to break, break things L- L- elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's allowed. It's almost going to cause, cause it to break, break horrifically later, later on. So what, so what, what, what do we just do? do? Well, because, well, because we, declared, we declared uh the C of R, R we, can we can reassign, reassign it. it. So, so before, before it was you know, an output, output type, type. Now, now it's, it's a reference to um the um the output gate. So. This is, this is going to break, break things, things. I'm going to undo it right, right now, now, and then please, please help me remember, remember to come back, back later on and to watch this break, break things, things downstream. downstream. Uh, another, another question, question. Please, please go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, uh, so, so that, 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 that is XOR. XOR. In this, In this case, case, the symbol is the same as Scala and Shizzle. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, so, so in, in general, general kind of, the, the language, language design, design philosophy, philosophy is, they want to make it as intuitive as possible, as possible so, so they generally uh, will overload, overload existing, existing operators, operators that they make sense and exist. exist. Uh, uh, the, the ones, ones they, they kind of have to stay away from were really just the plain equals, equals and, and the double equals for equality, equality testing. And the reason why is kind of important properties are used when you're kind of comparing or assigning references that you don't want to mess with semantics too much. But other than for equality testing and assignment, uh, it, generally it generally has the, the same syntax symbols, symbols you'd expect, expect from, from any other language. language. Um, and, I and I believe there was a question from chat, chat which is kind of the same, same question. Said, okay, if I, you know, had this, which, which legally is allowed, allowed to compile, uh, is, that is that going to synthesize? Is that going to break? break? So, no, so no, it's not going to synthesize, synthesize right? right? Because, because um, part of the key difference is, you think about programming language, when you assign something, it kind of almost you know, you know, implies, implies some, some sense, sense of either mutability or creation, creation, right? So the variable right. so didn't explore right now, now exists, exists, you assign the value, value to it. it. But if it had, it had an old value, value now you've overridden it. It's kind of like a like temporal, temporal aspect, aspect to it. With Chisel, we're, we're trying, trying to describe uh, a topology structure, structure right? right? So, so it's not so much that C equals this thing, it's more that C is connected to these things, right? So we don't have a Y or C, we want to connect to these other things. That's kind of the key lead there. So, so I'm going to go ahead and fix this and we'll come back to this in a second. Yeah, yeah sorry. sorry I heard, I heard questions. questions. Go, go ahead. ahead. You should, you should you, use, yeah, the, yeah, the, the question, question from chat was kind of checking, checking their uh, understanding. understanding. So, yes, yes cold equals, equals you should use for assignment and chisel things. things. You, you want to connect things to chisel? That's, that's what you're going to use. use. Uh, the single, single equals, equals that's, that's what you're going to use to uh, create variables. variables. And, and a variable, variable can be, be um, or just say, say a value, value, using value. Uh, a, a value can be either a Scala or, or a chisel, you know, object. object. Um, but, but usually, yeah, you use a single equal for that. that. That's, that's kind of what we're doing now. So when you're assigning like the Scala value or the chisel value itself, that, that reference, reference is getting, getting single, single equals, equals. We, we want connecting things, things that already, already exist. exist. Then, then we're, we're using, using the, the colon, colon equals. equals. No problem. No problem. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 like, like, this, this is why, why we're kind of spreading kind of lectures. lectures. We want to look at the stuff kind of clear at the beginning. And we want to kind of remember what we're doing. We're making a program that's making hard work. It's a little bit meta, but once we wrap our head around that, we'll be really empowered to do some cool stuff. Okay, so... 
let's go, go ahead, ahead and see what we've, what done. we've done. We've, we've made, made a module, module which, which should go back, back right? Okay, okay that's, that's neat. neat. But, but now, now what? Well, well, we haven't even executed the program, right? We just defined it so far. But let's say someplace else we were to instantiate an instance of this, then what do we do with that? Right, so, well, what can we do with that? There's a few things. One could be, maybe we know for a fact we want to use this in CAD tool flow, so we need parallel. So what we're going to do, we're going to make an instance of our module, uh, and, then and then this is a little, little bit of tactic sugar for just the notebook, notebook. It's not, not normally thing in chisel, chisel, but for today's, today's help, we're going to say, hey, give me the bear log. log. And then and we're going to print, print it if you want to see it. And so, so in Scala, is the normal thing. thing. You can say print, print for print, and print line, line, of course, as the next new line at the end. So yeah, what's going to do is this is elaborating design that's actually running it. And here's the bear log that would be produced by that. This is very helpful if you sometimes in the beginning want to play with things in time, or if you want to see what it's doing, you can see what's going forward. So... As I said before, before, knowing Verilog is 100% percent of course, 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 it's fine, and you know it, know it but you can still see it has structure, structure kind of expect, right? Where there's inputs, inputs A and B, output, output of C, and in this, this case, you know, for Verilog, we want to do a connection, you would assign, right? So, okay, so assign, and we're assigning C to the XOR A and B. Now, there's a little bit of wrinkles here, and these are kind of small details, how to be a way it's admitted, or elaborate, I say, but these aren't hard and fast, but a little more so just the way the code is admitted today. Uh, it, it chose, chose to, you know, turn, turn that dot, dot into an underscore, underscore right? right? So that was kind of making, making a new variable, variable name as a reasonable scope. scope. Right, because right, otherwise that dot can apply to the module, module hierarchy, right? 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 And, and, you know, that doesn't really make sense in this concept of the Verilog. Verilog. Additionally, there's, there's a clock, clock and reset, even though this block is purely combinational. The reason why is every module in Chisholm has an implicit clock and reset. A very ambitious emitter perhaps could, you know, take the time to bother bother including these. Perhaps, Perhaps future, future versions of Chisel won't even bother doing that. You can, you can prune that away. But the reason why it's bother pruning it away right now is that most downstream CAD tools, tools are going to recognize this is not needed and just remove it and prune it, prune it away. It's going to do that elimination automatically. Another, Another little uh, extra, which, which is you know, not always going to be there, it, it remembered the line this came from. This is kind of a very subtle point that comes up a lot when you're doing an embedded DSL, that is you're writing one language to generate another one language to generate something else. Is when you have a problem, how do you, do you figure out if you're going to transpile from language, language A to language, language B? If you have a problem in language B, you know, some tool is breaking, how do you trace that back, back to what language A? So, so to help, help with that, that Chisel actually remembers, remembers what line the original, original file produced that. So in the so notebook today, this is kind of totally arbitrary, because you know, we're just going to learn how to make the notebook do the cool stuff. But in your more proper notional designs, you're going to see like a line in the file, and that makes sense. This is kind of a handy thing if you ever need to bug at that level. For most, For most of this course, course, you're probably, probably never, never going to look at the barrel. But if that's interesting to you, we're showing, showing you here in this. Um, and, and what else is there? Well, what if we actually, actually wanted to visualize it? So there's, so there's something, something called a diagrammer. So a fun research project that's been made, made, which can go, can go ahead and crawl a chisel circuit, circuit and um, make a diagram of using graph So get graph results and go ahead and visualize that. So I'm using that here. This tool, this tool uses kind of these box diagrams, diagrams which sometimes, sometimes you'll find very interesting, but sometimes you'll find not as helpful. helpful. Uh, I recommend that something you find maybe potentially useful, useful. Maybe, maybe some of the time you can use this inside the Jupyter, Jupyter Notebooks on Binders, binders so that, that way you can let Binder, binder worry about selling graphics and running graphics for you. Um, but but uh, that's that. As far as what's going on syntax-wise, once again, visualize isn't a normal chisel keyword. It's something you need to know what environment we created for this course to make it kind of nice simple syntax. Uh, this business, business over, over here, here, we're going to come to that, that uh, later, later on, on. But for, for now, you should focus on the fact that, you know, yeah, we have initiated an instance for a module. module. Tentatively, what this is, 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 is delaying the evaluation. evaluation. And, and there's some reasons why we want to make the evaluation, evaluation, evaluation way to waste past around. around. But, but that's a that's detail, detail for now. You should add a boilerplate. Cool. So, yeah, here's an example. Okay, we had a circuit. We looked at the Verilog in my use, one of the tools. We looked at the diagram to make sure, okay, that's kind of what we expected. What else, what else can we, can do, we with do with this? this? Well, well, maybe, maybe we, should we should go ahead and test, test it. So, so first, first, I think, I think about, about the back end, back end right? right? So, so the back, back end, you know, we have, have these, you know, fertile files. files. Like, like I said, I said it was a little bit fast and loose. loose. Typically, uh, you, uh, you do run, run this fertile tool always to kind of process the fertile file and go from high level to low level to little detail. But for now, just be aware that, you know, yes, we have a circuit in this fertile format. And what do we do with it? Most, Most time, time in this course, course, what you're going to be doing, doing you're going to be simulating it. And in order to simulate it, you need to use a simulator. One, One nice simulator, simulator is out there. Something, something called, called Treadle. 
It's actually, it's actually a simulator, simulator of Rune and Skull. So that way, it kind of sees all the Skull ecosystems. ecosystems. It's, it's nice, obviously, obviously it's not, not super fast, fast but by, by virtue of not having the compiled the compiles compiles evolved, evolved, it actually is reasonably a quick quick for small designs. And so, yeah, the simulator of Rune is what going to do. Well, the simulator is going to model the behavior of the circuit. But what's the circuit doing? Right? Well, the circuit needs something to kind of interact with it. Something to say, hey, here's an input. Look at this output and interact with that. So you need some sort of stimulus. So this, so this kind of configuration, configuration doing this course off, you have a simulator, simulator uh, talking, talking to some sort of tester. Sort of tester. Um, that's going to be you know, you know, setting various inputs and looking, looking at the outputs outputs and seeing the right, right thing. thing. Uh, so, so the tester will be the outputs and say, you know, search your style, hey, this is, you know, correct or not correct, and perhaps kill things. Additionally, the simulation can also tell you classic simulation output times and things, right? You can have, do you want to do print tests? You can do print tests. Or if you want to wait for them. You can, you can do that, that too. too. So that's, that's a, a .dcd, .dcd file. file. It's the waveform you're using. You can use, waveform waveform viewer. Viewer. You can you can use that, that as well. Um, so, this so this is the most common thing you use, of course, typically running this. And so normally have things set up where these exact details about, about you know, what, what is treadle. treadle. We're kind of hiding under the hood from you. Just kind of simulate and it does it. And you can choose inside the code what solution back end is using. But the treadle is nice because it's in Scala. It's very quickly running and such. As an, as an aside, aside from, from some of my group's research, research, we actually are actually building an alternative uh, backend for Fertile. And its, and its main advantage is just speed. So it's, so it's called Essence. And it's designed, designed for larger designs and, and there's a chance, chance to compile and run things. things. And yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's very, very, very fast. fast. But, but the reason why it's doing that is taking the Fertile, doing a lot of correlations to it, and then spinning up the plus code and compiling the proper plus program and running that. And that's going to go really fast. Don't need that for this course. Don't worry. It's just an aside for you in context for having the research. But alternatively, maybe, maybe as, as I said before, before maybe we want a parallel file, file right? right? You can you run Fertile to do that. that. And later, and later on, of course, we'll talk about the fact how even if you want a parallel file, file, you may want different flavors of parallel file. file. You may want a parallel file, file that uh, you know, you know, is designed for FPGA versus a parallel file designed for ASIC. Maybe you want to do certain transformation to help your tools. You can do a lot of cool things inside this Fertile library. We're going to cover that like way at like week seven or week eight. So for now, you don't need to worry about that. But just be aware that, yes, you can... Take the stop file, file and use some more of these tools, tools and produce a Verilog, and, and then you know, go to conventional CAD tools. Would it be for, for Verilog simulator, simulator? Or you, or you want to do, you know, you know place, place and route, route synthesis, synthesis, et cetera. OK, okay so uh, Chisel test, test kind of way we're going to interact with our designs. So this is kind of the last thing we need to kind of close the loop. We covered just enough skull to get a beat web. We wrote enough chisel to get a module. Great. We've created, created the module, module exists. exists. Now, now we, need we need to go, go ahead and, and interact, interact with it, right? So, so the school cool about chisel tests, tests is we're able to write, write that interaction in Scala, Scala right? So, so with the full power of the language, language right, you know, arbitrary, arbitrary things. things. And uh, so it's running, running in Scala. Scala. And, and I should, I should maybe, maybe go back a slide. This is a Scala program, right? So our simulation in this case is also a Scala program. Like I said, you can use other simulation back ends, or maybe your simulation is being done by some other tool, including a parallel simulator or something. If you're, if you're using, using chisel test, test the, the test, test side is actually, actually a Scala program, program which, which is kind of sometimes uh, to have all those power Scala ability, right? And so, yeah, and so, yeah, so what, what you're going to do with the tester, tester is you're going to set the inputs, inputs look, look at the outputs, outputs and perhaps have, have, have some insertion, insertion and things, things like that. that. Um, and, and so, so as it goes through this course, we're kind of have to more more sophisticated testers. So, for example, for this week's homework, which is going to come out probably tomorrow, it's going to be due, you know, next week. Uh, uh, next Thursday, Thursday, for example, um, um, you're going to be writing, writing test, test cases that are pretty, pretty, pretty bare bones, bones, right? They're basically like, like you know, mainly things you should put and mainly like each output. output. As, as soon as, as next week, we're going to teach you some little bit more Scala, you're going to make more intelligent, intelligent test cases. You use things, things like loops and, and you know, random, random number generators to actually get a little bit more concise coverage, right? And so what's the API we're working with? Well, that for these kinds of testers is peak poke test testers. Uh, uh, even though even we call them peak poke, poke, I think maybe the way we're thinking of them is poke, poke peak. peak. Uh, so, uh, so what is poke? Poke, poke is setting, setting a value. value. So hey, hey there's, there's a wire. wire. Boom, boom. We need to have this value. value. Peak, peak is reading a wire. And then, and then expect, expect is when, when we can look at the value of the wire. wire. So it's kind of like, like a peak and a certain combined, combined, right? right. Um, OK, so let's advance. So here's a little test that we wrote. So we just had two one-bit inputs. We can, we can exhaustively, exhaustively test, test this thing, thing right? right? So, so we, wrote we wrote all four cases. cases. So maybe, so maybe we go ahead and actually uh, put, put some, some new lines, lines to make this more clear, right? So we can see all four cases here. here. So, so what do we, do we have? have? Well, there's a little bit of a boilerplate here, but for the most part, what we're doing is we are instantiating 
an instance, instance of our, of our, of our module. module. And then, and then given, given that, that module, module, we're going to go, go ahead and, and do some stuff, stuff with it, right? right? So, so we'll, we'll cover the syntax in more in detail to kind of get to the more scholar in the coming lectures, lectures, but, but for today, today you can kind of just boilerplate. boilerplate. Um, test test is, is, is a syntactic sugar, sugar from the Chisel, Chisel Test uh, library. library. But here, but here we, we are. So for our, our designer, designer tests, tests, which we're, we're calling X in this case, case, we call it DUT designer test, whatever you want to call it. It's a, it's a, it's a module. It's an object. Go ahead and reference, reference into that. that. So we can say, hey, okay, okay, of that, that object, of its I.O., of the I.O.s, of A, set it to this value. Set OK, set to zero or false, right? Okay, so set both inputs to false. And, and then, then we're going to go expect, expect, we can be P, but P3, you actually want to have, have the assertion, assertion kind of property. We're going to expect, expect that C is going to be zero, right? Because zero, right? Cause zero uh, X or zero, zero should be zero, right? right? And then we can do the other cases, right? right? We did, uh, you know, maybe you might, you might find a million million account in that order. Maybe the account in this order maybe is less surprising. Perhaps a good tactic in programming is to try and minimize size for your users. Okay, so... You have, you have these are test, test cases. cases. If you go, go ahead and just run, run this, this, what's it going to do? do? Well, well it, it just ran and said we did good. good. So, so that's, that's cool. cool. Um, um, so in this so case, case, we didn't, didn't have anything, anything wrong. Uh, perhaps you're, you're like me, you're like, oh my gosh, wait, did I do this right? Did I? So maybe we go ahead and literally break our test case. And then we're going to see it fail, right? Oh, 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 IOC was, was true, i.e. One, 1, did not expect, uh, not not equal expect, which was false, false right? right? So, so we, we, we would tell it to expect false, false told it to expect zero, zero, and it got, got a one. 1. That's, That's the problem, problem, right? So, so but, of course, we we'll go ahead and test case, case, and it's going to pass again. again. So, so, for a, for a lot, lot of time, you're using uh, these testers to kind of get your modules going, right? Where you want to make testing, you can test unit tests, kind of using individual modules, you can test combination of modules. And this is more sophisticated test features. Uh, and, and also, also you can learn how to use Scala, Scala around, around these peak and to kind of make, make more sophisticated, sophisticated uh, test, test patterns. patterns. Uh, uh, question. question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, oh, zero, zero test, test pass. pass. Um, that's, that's, that's a good, a good question. question. I suspect, I suspect that's something, something about the way, way we set things up in this notebook. Um, we, in, this in this case, case we didn't ask yeah, so the question, question why, why is zero test pass? pass? Yeah, yeah, it's a good, a good question. question. Uh, I suspect like the, the way we think of this notebook, notebook there's, there's more structure, structure in Scala language to kind of more, more properly label and mark out test, test cases as it goes through tests. And, and so I think if we use that structure more fully, it would be a, a properly recognized test, test as opposed to this uh, test uh, as a uh, syntactic sugar to like really uh, um, go, go after, after just testing this case right now that really concise. But normally you actually would like use subclass and extend Existing, existing test or module, module do more proper, proper thing. But, but this is just, like I said, very good concise syntax, syntax we're using to try and get things going quickly, but uh, you'll, you'll see normally more proper syntax. I bet you, you hypothetically, that I'm guessing, this is me not, not sure, sure, that this, this is based, based on, on, you know, look at the, the counts, counts because, because we didn't subclass class properly, or at all, really, really it's going to be counting as zero. I think I saw another question go by about, okay, we talked about peak and poke, but I only see poke. Yes, this test case only has poke. Um, so, so you can, you can imagine, imagine maybe a more, a more smart, smart, more sophisticated test case maybe with some more temporal behavior to our circuit. Uh, perhaps, perhaps you want, want to, uh, you know, poke, poke some values, values look, at look at the response, response and then based, based on the response, response that, that peak, peak value, you don't necessarily want, want to do an assertion, assertion on it, but then, then from that peak you want to change what you do to the next poke value, right? So that way if you want to read those outputs without having to find the assertion of property, that's what peak is for. So even though you call it peak poke, it's, it's you know, you know, more, more likely, likely to poke in than to expect. expect. It's kind of the most, most common pattern. pattern. And then maybe a couple, a couple peaks, peaks here and there if you want to read the value to make a more intelligent poke, poke for a department, department test case. case. Um, oh, oh, question, question is, is, could I look, I look at, at intermediate, intermediate values? values. Uh, that's, uh, that's a good, good question. question. The answer should be yes, but you know, with these notebooks, which are a little bit experimental, so to speak, let's find out. So let's go back to our test case. Great. Great. So, so um, um, do we have, do we have time? time? Yes, yes, we do. Okay, okay I'm going to go ahead and uh, make uh, a, a little bit of extra hard work. Let's say we want to make, uh, you know, you know uh, another, another gate. gate. So, so here, here I'm writing, writing this is a variable, variable point, point to that snippet. snippet. Um, 
Yeah, yeah I, I need, need to make, make it a wire, wire aren't I? I? Yeah. yeah. Oops. And then, and then we'll cover, we'll cover wire, wire uh, on Friday. Friday. Uh, uh, but, but then, then um, fine, 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 So, so same thing with like TA is bailing out, out. He's, he's saying that this, this current version of peak post test, uh, you cannot peak, peak intermediate, intermediate values. values. So, so before, before I make a message, message file, file and start running, running stuff, stuff. Uh, so, so the answer, answer is no, unfortunately not, not peak post intermediate, intermediate values. values. Prior, Prior version of Mims allow that. Um, but, but more, more importantly, uh, to answer the question from the advanced thing, if we want to see intermediate values, yes, we could do a print test, right? So print test can read internal things. Right, right, and, and I'm going to forget the hex specifiers. specifiers. But, like, but like, let's say, for example, example I think... Ah, uh, that's, that's a valid, valid one, hopefully. hopefully. Uh, and then, and then you, know, you know, we can say x.io.a. Dot dot dot, dot, you know, Oops. Oops. And, and I'm not right valid, valid Oops. Oops, yeah, yeah thank you, JGS. I'm going to have a little data in my syntax. Ah. Oops, no, no, not that, that way. way. Uh, I, need I need to, to then go back. back. Yes, yes, this is why it's going to have a team. Uh, Chisel's, Chisel's language, language has evolved quite a bit over the years. That's why I'm a little bit sometimes like, like, like you're a little, little confused. confused. Uh, uh, as as kind of needs to change. change. Oops, Oops there's no longer X because it's now inside of here. So now, here's a good point out, right? So we defined a printf. This printf is not a Scala feature. It's a Chisel feature. We'll cover this more in a future lecture. So, so if, if I, go I go on, on to like, like oops, if I go, I go on to a future slide, uh, and let's say I rerun this, uh, it's going to actually use the Verilog, Verilog write function, which is basically a Verilog, Verilog printf. printf. In, other In other words, words notice, notice how, how it didn't, didn't actually print the value out, because, because printing, printing the value out doesn't actually happen from the module thing of value. So this is not synthesizable, right? It's not hardware to have printf, but if we wanted to go forward with that, and then not do the simulation, Every, Every time, time this module is evaluated, evaluated we're going to see that, that printf, print uh, which is right there. Right there. Um, OK. okay. Maybe a little bit of a test, test case, case, but I think it's a good, good sample. sample. Um, so, I so I think I have, I have one, one more question. question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, so verification, verification is a, a complex, complex question. question. The question is about verification. Uh, for verification, um, there's, there's a lot, lot to it. Uh, you can, can verify a chisel. chisel. Uh, depending, depending on your scenario, you may, may not want, want to. The reason, the reason why, why is if you're, you're like a large company and you're you manufacturing a chip, chip you're, you're not manufacturing a chisel. You're technically manufacturing the output of the chisel program, which is a very long path into the other tools. So very often those companies will choose to Verify, verify the barrel log comes, comes out rather than the chisel, chisel test, you know, trying to make, to make it more close, close to the section goes through the tools. Uh, uh, later, later on, of course, we're going to cover more verification needs. There's a lot of research about new ways to do verification and some cool research even in chisel itself. But for, but for now, in the coming weeks, we'll see time having testers and more sophisticated testers. In regard to the other questions about, wait a second, if I can't peak intermediate values, it makes it a little bit harder to test cases. Yeah, it can be a little onerous. Not discussed here, there's a way to... Pull, pull out uh, a, 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 a signal, signal side signal chisel, chisel thing, thing to the top level and easier to do this kind of stuff. stuff. Once, Once again, again uh, it'll be kind of a fun and interesting work that it's notebooks or not. Um, um, with that, that, we are, are out of time. time. So I do want to make sure to end recording. recording.
Uh, uh, thank everybody. Stop recording. Stay, 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 stay